Okay, so <laughs> after the initial music portion of our weekly gathering, we typically go into something called a community moment. And it's a time for someone from the Oasis community to get up and share a, uh, you know, thought for the day. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, you, know, an, uh, you know, something you're passionate about, an idea you've been working with, um, something from a book you've read, or a uh, life experience you've had. It could be almost anything. We've had a lot of great community moments, and if you'd like to do one, just um, get with me and I'll get you on the calendar. My name is Mike and you can get me at mike at houstonoasis.org, just send me an email and uh, we'll be happy to get you on the calendar. Um, oh, and we also need some people to be on uh, chair patrol because it looks like we are starting to bring in some extra, we might need some extra chairs eventually. So just keep an eye out on that, thank you. Um, so today's community moment is done by uh, one of our chief sound guys, maybe our chief sound guy, or um, who does so much for us every week. Fred Thompson. So let's give Fred a warm welcome. Hello. My topic today is the benefits of religion. This is not tongue-in-cheek. In my journey from Christianity to atheism, uh, I was outside of religion for many years, and there are some things I missed. There are some fundamental human needs that were not satisfied when I was outside of a group, and that's really what I want to want to focus on today. Uh, actual topic is some reasonable and unreasonable reasons for religion because there are things in religion that make perfectly good sense to me and there are some other things that don't make much sense at all and I think we need to get our heads around that as secularist because if we don't understand that then we can't speak with authority when we talk about the good and bad things about religion uh, religious services usually start with the lighting of a candle, so I lit a candle here. This just isn't just any candle. This is an alleged lucky flame candle. It is a money-drawing candle. And the idea, according to the, the little lady in the checkout line at Fiesta who told me about it, she saw it and was talking about it, and she uses these, and she says they brought her really good luck. In fact, she always burns one before she buys a lottery ticket, and she's never won the lottery, but she's gotten more numbers. <laughs> and you have to, but you have to believe in the flame. You have to put your faith in the flame and not let doubt get in the way. So, okay, I believe in the flame. I'm trusting the flame. Where's oh, Catherine? Fred, here I am. Here's the $100 I owe you. Well, look at this. A brand new $100 bill freshly printed. Now, <laughs> now I, hope, I hope you all understand that the reason, oh by the way, that's Catherine. Catherine is my freeloader friend who borrowed a hundred dollars from me more than a year ago and she borrowed it for something really stupid. She needed, she needed to buy insulin for her diabetic cat. <laughs> but I hope everybody can see that because I lit the candle and because I believed in the flame, money came my way. Everybody agree with that? Okay. See, they agree. Okay, if you do agree, then you're doing something called magical thinking. And by, and by the way, this is not a religious candle, so I'm not criticizing, I'm not criticizing religion here. According to psychologist James Alcock, Magical thinking is the interpreting of two closely occurring events as though one caused the other without having any concern for our causal link. For example, if you believe that burning this candle will bring you good fortune, and subsequently you, as I just was, are the recipient of good fortune, you've associated the act of candle burning with the subsequent welcome event, and you've imputed a causal link between the two. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's entirely benign, except Alcock notes that because of our neurobiological makeup, 
We are prone to magical thinking, and therefore critical thinking is often at a disadvantage. And that's the problem with magical thinking. But my topic today is religion, and so far we haven't discussed religion. We've discussed the, quote, alleged lucky flame candle, which I'm going to blow out. So let's move on to religion. This is a St. Christopher medal. St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers. I grew up in South Louisiana, Cajun country, 90% Roman Catholic. Most of the people I knew, including my mother, had a St. Christopher medal somewhere in the car, and they sincerely believed that if they had a St. Christopher medal, St. Christopher would protect them from harm. And again, it worked. I grew up and we never had a serious car accident while I was growing up. She honestly believed that. She didn't believe the medal would protect her. What she believed is by venerating this saint, he would intercede with God and protect us. So we're talking about intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer most often is where you ask God to intercede in the normal course of events to make some good thing happen. And I have a question back here, but I, I really would prefer if you wait because I got a lot of material. We'll try to do questions at the end. And so far, we've just covered Yes, I want to talk something about intercessory prayer. How common is it and how many people believe in it? According to the Pew Research Center in their 2012 groundbreaking American Religious Landscape study in which they interviewed more than 30,000 people, 75% of Americans pray at least weekly. Now that's everyone including us, not just religious people. 71% believe in God with absolute certainty and 49% believe their prayers are answered at least several times a year. So this intercessory prayer really is a big deal to many Americans. And this brings us to the first benefit of religion. We enjoy the comfort and security of magical thinking. It's a false security and a false comfort, but it's very important to many people. The second benefit of religion is understanding why things happen. We humans are a curious bunch and we're not merely satisfied to understand what happens. We want to know why something happens. I saw a great example a few months ago, actually I guess it was last year or some time back. The media were interviewing a lady in Joplin, Missouri who had just lost everything. Her house was leveled. And they love to pick situations like that. She's picking through the rubble, looking for a few mementos she can salvage. And they asked her, what are you going to do now? You've lost everything. And I, I don't remember her exact words, but I'll paraphrase what I remember her saying. I know everything happens for a reason. It's just part of God's plan, which I don't understand. But I know something, eventually something good will come of this. And that's the understanding why things happen. And remember, 500 years ago, we didn't understand much about anything. And God is always the default. And it's always bad things happen, but God has a plan. And they're part of God's plan. And God's plan is what's best for us. And almost everything was explained that way. As we learn more and more about science, we're able to explain fewer things just on God's plan, but there are still a lot of things that people explain that way. Uh, one of the great composers of 20th century uh, religious music said it this way, it is humanity's quest for solace and light amid the darkness and troubles of our ages. Recently I was reading something by an atheist whose name I don't remember. He explained it a little differently. Religion makes it easier to deal with all the shitty things that happen to us. <laughs> And that's true. So what can we offer to the person who believes a religious medal will protect him or the person who just lost everything in a tornado? First, we have to understand that people who 
are practicing religion in whatever form are being perfectly human. We are hardwired for spirituality and the dogmatic side of religion is just an intervention, in, invention of people who wish to exercise power over other people and control their beliefs and actions. According to Dr. George E. Valiant, MD, a Harvard scientist, in his Spiritual Evolution, How We Are Wired for Faith, Hope, and Love, he says, he shows that our spirituality resides in our uniquely human brain design, in our innate capacity for emotions like love, hope, joy, forgiveness, and compassion, which are located in a different part of our brain than dogmatic religious belief. Evolution has made us spiritual creatures. Over time, he writes, and we are destined to become even more so. So that's the first thing we need to understand, in spite of the fact that we disagree with religious people, when they're doing their religious thing and believing their religious beliefs, they are being perfectly human. The second thing we must understand, and this may come as a shock to you, but intercessory prayer does work. It's hard to believe that it works, but it does work, and studies have been done that have shown how it works and to what extent it works. And the studies I'm talking about are where doctors, in one groundbreaking study, some doctors, I think they were ca cardiovascular surgeons, and they were studying people who had had cardiovascular surgery, and they seemed to observe that the people who prayed and had people praying for them did better than the people who didn't, and they didn't understand that. They had no ax to grind. I think they were religious people, but they were curious. They're scientists, and they were curious to test it. So they got some psychologists in to actually test it, and what they found is the people who prayed and who had pray people praying for them did significantly better, at least measurably better, in many areas, like the amount of anesthesia, I mean the amount of pain medication they required, incidence of complication, length of stay in the hospital, but there's one catch. It only worked if they knew people were praying for them. So they also scheduled some people from local churches and they gave the people at the church the patient's name and told them all about them, asked them to pray for this person. In those cases, it had no effect whatsoever. So what this tells us is prayer has a significant placebo effect. So when people say they believe in prayer, they probably have observed situations where prayer has actually worked. In the case of the person who believes in the St. Christopher medal, I would not contradict their belief because I'm not going to get through to them, but what I'd tell them, if you think this medal protects you, and it gives you comfort, hey, knock yourself out. I have no problem with that. But have, since you're obviously interested in travel safety, have you considered what science tells us about travel safety, especially in cars? And we all know the answer to that. If you really want to be safe in your car, what do you do? One, buckle up. Two, don't text while driving. Three, don't drive if you've been drinking, especially if you've had too much to drink. Four, drive a speed that is reasonable for traffic conditions. And last, be, maintain some situational awareness. Watch the car that's coming up to the stop sign, stop light when yours just turned green, because this is Houston, Texas. And <laughs> yellow means go faster, and red means three more cars. And if you're not careful, you might get T-boned. So given that choice, let me just ask this group, given that choice, you can have the St. Christopher medal or you can do the four or five things I just mentioned. Which do you think would protect you better? Doing the four or five things, even though you don't do it. <laughs> doing... Hey, I know the red light means just to still go. <laughs> so 
even though, and in the, case, in the case of the lady who lost everything, of course I wouldn't contradict you. She is not in a, a career. She's in no, contra, in no position to be contradicted. But as a group, we can provide something that's far more valuable than just trusting that God has a plan and everything is going to be okay. We provide understanding of the unknown through science, the human personality, and social behavior, which is why every one of our meetings is kind of like a TED talk. <laughs> I would also tell her that we're here for her and let us know what she needs. And I wouldn't just ask her to let, her know what she, let us know what she needs. I would actively find out what we can do to help her. And that's the next benefit of religion. Whoops, it went backwards. <laughs> Having a support group. Support group can be important. It can be absolutely necessary if you're going through a personal crisis, but even on a day-to-day -day basis. A group like Oasis can be an important support group. Catherine Kelly, my freeloader friend, and I just bought condos. We both bought condos, and we're both in the process of moving stuff in. And I told Catherine, you know, you're going to reach a point where you've got something you need to move around and you can't do it by yourself. Give me a call. We'll drive over and we'll move it. And Friday we moved to, 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 drove to College Station, moved a couple of TV sets. Now, of course, I don't know if she would ever ask me to help her, but because I see Oasis as a support group, I offered the help and I told her specifically what I could do, so she took me up on it. Yay! And I've got... Ask for his upper body. Uh, some of you may have seen that... Uh, how am I doing on time, Mike? I've got to wrap it up. Okay, I'll just cover this one and I'll tell you what the others are. But some may have seen that three-minute clip I said people might want to look at by Bishop Shelby J. Spong. And what he, he is a very liberal Christian. And what he basically said is forget about the dogma, forget about the Bible, forget about all that stuff. Instead, focus on what it means to become more fully human, which to me means becoming a better person. And a group like Oasis can really help us with this sort of thing through some of the talks we have. Uh, the next one. Oh, Frank, you know what? You said you were going to just tell us what the other ones Yeah. Oh. I'd like you to um, save those for another. Okay. This is fascinating. And I want, I'd like you to do like a main talk on the other one. Okay. I'm going to go through one more. Well, something's happened here. Let's see what. Divine intervention. <laughs> <laughs> Be part of a community of like-minded people. And this is the last one I'm going to cover. And we've talked about this, and I only want to say something. I want to tell you what America's leading expert on Sunday morning secular free thought communities has to say about this. <laughs> Regarding, regardless of theological orientation, there is some kind of deeply ingrained basic human need for community. Homo sapiens are a tribal species that need support from others that cannot be denied. And I'll quickly just tell you what the others are. They are making a difference, being part of something bigger than just ourselves, celebration, and finding inspiration and hope. Thank you.